Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Jack West, medical oncologist and founder and CEO of the Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education, or GRACE. We're going to continue with the next part of our program on molecular markers in lung cancer, who to test and what to test for. I was joined in this program by Dr. Charlie Rudin at the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Also Dr. Alice Shaw, assistant professor and thoracic oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Also Dr. David Spiegel, thoracic oncologist and director of clinical research and the lung cancer program at the Sarah Cannon Cancer Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And finally, Dr. Glenwood or Glenn Goss, the chair of the Lung Cancer Committee of the National Cancer Institute in Canada and professor at the University of Ottawa in Ontario, Canada. Let's turn to the next presentation. Dr. Spiegel runs a network from the Sarah Cannon Research Institute, and it's a very impressive network that includes a broad range of largely community-based oncologists. So in that setting, it's really representative of a practice pattern outside of the physicians that we've talked about. I think it's helpful to talk about the challenges as well as the potential benefits of how is integrating this whole model changing how we do clinical research. To me, this is really the other big challenge right now is we already have a hard time getting patients onto clinical trials for a lot of reasons. We just talked about another one that's just emerged where we just started therapy while we're waiting for molecular results to come back, and that may or may not make it even harder to get a patient onto a study. Jack asked me to review how we're going to move forward. I don't know that I have the answers, but I thought I'd address some of the issues. So this is kind of the old way, is the all-comers model, which is you take a new therapy, we'll just call drug A or treatment one here, and you're just trying to see is it better than what's already out there. So you're comparing A versus B, or in this case, treatment one versus treatment two, and you're hoping that the newer therapy, the one that all the scientists are very excited about, is good enough to show a difference. That kind of all-comers approach to clinical research, whether it's lung, breast, or GI malignancies, whatever you're referring to, has had a few successes. My other slides say there's been a few home runs, although I would argue these aren't really home runs. These maybe are singles or doubles for those who are baseball fans. And I'm referring to drugs like Avastin and Tarceva and Herbitux. Now, Herbitux was a trial where technically patients had to have expression of EGFR, but really, since that is expressed in almost every case, these are all comer trials. In each one of these studies, the drug won. The drug was better than the standard but we could all argue that the benefits have been modest. Now, some things have come out of these studies. You can go back and find markers. You can search through collected tissue samples and maybe make a discovery. So I don't want to say that these are useless trials. Certainly very pivotal trials, all made major publications, and certainly have moved the field forward. What this slide shows I borrowed from a colleague, although we've all seen many slides like this, unfortunately, every year, And this is just one of about eight slides I could show like this. These are all new and exciting drugs, and I bet all of us have worked with most of these drugs. Basically, all of these studies were negative. I make the exception for Bevacizumab or Avastin there. These were all large trials, thousands of patients, all trying to look at the issue of taking the standard therapy and taking the new therapy and seeing if the new therapy is better. And we haven't really made progress here. And this will come up even with other trials that are still in progress. We expect this list to continue to grow, unfortunately. And the question is, can we do better trials? So this is why there's reason to have hope here, that maybe if we can do smarter studies by selecting the patients better, we'll have a better chance of showing the results. And I show you these home runs that have already happened. These are real home runs. I haven't been an oncologist for 30 years, but I can tell you that these drugs are some of the greatest advances in cancer care in the last three decades. Without going through every drug here, each one of these drugs, without question, is a home run. I point out trastuzumab or Herceptin. There's a drug that almost didn't make it. It used kind of an all-comer design. The testing for HER2 was later found out to be not ideal, and it was very possible that that drug was not going to show a benefit in the patients it was tested in because of the way the study was designed, and that could have been the end of Herceptin, and think of the implications that could have had for thousands of women. What are the benefits from trying to design better clinical trials? Well, 
In theory, you can speed the time up from a discovery that's made in the laboratory to actually having a drug in your hands to give to a patient. If you can find answers quicker with smarter designs and trials, it's likely drugs will be approved faster. And the greatest example, and all the kudos go to Alice and all of her colleagues around the world who helped bring Zakori to market quickly. It's possible smaller trials could be done. Again, Zakori is a good example of that. I'll go through that in a moment. Maybe we can preserve our patient and trial resources. So not only our patients, who obviously are so valuable and the tissue that we're biopsying, but Simple things like the other folks involved in getting patients on clinical trials at centers can be working on other things. Perhaps we can make faster go, no-go decisions. If you know a therapy works really well in a small number of people, a real home run, that's going to help not only that drug move along in its development, but it'll help other drugs like it, maybe that are better versions of it, get developed or help other drugs that maybe were going to head in that direction stop and go in another direction. So there can be certainly downstream or trickle-down effects for how drugs are developed. Glenn's going to get into cost issues, but it raises the question if you're doing smaller trials with select populations of patients and your trials are going faster, are you reducing the cost of doing research? And are we going to make better gains in outcomes? I mentioned Herbitux and Avastin and Tarceva all have shown positive advantages in survival, but are these really substantial gains? Are we seeing response rates that approach 90% for patients, or are we really just settling for small gains? I'm actually surprised. Two speakers have talked about Zakori, but this slide has not been shown yet. Uh, this, <laughs> and it's because it's such a wonderful slide, right? This is basically trying to show that everybody who has a bar on the top graph pointing south or downwards is benefiting from the drug. So this was Zalcori. All these patients had ALK. Alice has already been through this in much detail. But meant to show you that it doesn't take a medical oncologist, a physician, or any kind of scientist to figure out that something is working here and that this is probably going to be a home run. What this is meant to show you is how fast things happen. In 2007, when a lot of the work began to move forward with ALK and ultimately the development of drugs to target this. And in August of this year, Zalcori's on the market. So four years for a drug to be considered to ultimately being approved, that's tremendous. So what are the challenges? I tried to limit this to three. Unfortunately, there's a lot more challenges than there are benefits right now. So I'm going to say these kind of simply. We have to change how we do things. We all have been trained to do clinical research a certain way, but we have to get away from that. We have to have our partners in industry get away from that, understanding that we have to design better trials, smarter trials that rely on tissue testing up front to select our patients. And that gets into the issues Jack already mentioned about reflex testing and core biopsies. That changes how pathologists work in hospitals. It changes how doctors think about enrolling patients to studies, and nobody likes change. We have to think about how we do our testing. We have to think about competing studies. So if I have a trial right now that's an all-comers type trial where my patient can go on that today, or they have to wait three to four weeks to go on to a study because I'm waiting for the ALK results to come back, how am I going to decide or how's the patient going to decide which trial to go on and which trial benefits and which trial suffers? We have to think about how the FDA, how regulatory authorities, how insurers deal with outcomes from studies. So Corey's success was really based on that graph I showed you, people's tumors getting smaller. But what if a drug doesn't cause a tumor to get smaller but just keeps people alive longer? So it doesn't result in a response rate. Should that drug be developed and approved? What are the benchmarks that we're going to need to have for certain drugs getting approved now? And what about resources? You have smaller groups of patients now. If it's true that 1% to 2% of patients have a Ross abnormality or a RET abnormality, can every academic center around the world be studying that population of patients? Is that a fair use of that limited patient population? Maybe centers have to collaborate to study these rare patients. There's issues about ownership. Who owns the tissue? I think we all feel strongly that patients own the tissue, but for a long time, that's not been clear. The institutions have certainly claimed ownership of it. Industry does. The tissue gets sent to some industry partners for some of these studies. Practices are not always set up to deal with biopsying tissue. We address some of that. And then a knowledge gap. It's hard to keep up with things. Things come out and are discovered so quickly that doesn't always translate into what doctors understand in the clinic. And then what I think is most interesting, is this the right approach? 
is everything going to be an oncogenic driving mutation, or are tumors too heterogeneous to expect that one drug is going to be right for that patient? The issues about testing, the issues about how we biopsy patients, do metastatic biopsies, are they different than biopsying the primary tumor site? Are archival material the best way to test for some of these markers? I think there's hope, though. Alice referred to this. This came really from her group and colleagues. This just came out in January, what, six weeks ago, this pivotal publication of this other rearrangement that's been discovered in Ross 1. She showed you a nice pie chart of 31 patients. But just two weeks ago in Nature Medicine, another discovery of RET inversions or translocations has been reported, and we already have a drug on the market that targets RET. That's in six weeks' time, we've had two publications, small numbers of patients, maybe one, two percent of the whole population. But one can make an argument that these might be the next home runs, and is it going to take seven years, ten years to get these drugs approved for these rare situations? Hopefully not. Hopefully it's four years or shorter. Great. So as a global question, are we going to see a fundamental change in how most of our at least targeted therapies are developed so that we're no longer looking for broad populations anymore of first-line therapy with a chemo backbone plus or minus drug X? Are we, for the future, going to be looking at drug development in this or that population, whether it's defined by molecular marker or sometimes we are seeing, currently at least, agents being developed based on histology? So are the old platforms going away for good? I think that everything points in that direction. All our current knowledge points in that direction. However, there are always a lot of surprises in medicine, and there may be very fundamental biological activities, for instance, apoptosis, something along that line, or stem cell biology, which will be a home run in a larger percentage of patients. I don't think we'll ever get back to the era where we gave the same chemotherapy for all of lung cancer or the same chemotherapy for all of breast cancer. But there is conceivably areas that are fundamental to a large number of tumors in their biology that we may still be able to hit. And I think that the current trend looks as though it's going to be smaller and smaller populations, but that may not be the case in the future. Yeah, I think that sea change is already occurring. Initially, there was a fair bit of resistance to that among some pharmaceutical companies. Their goal was really to market a drug to the broadest possible patient population. You don't want a drug that only hits 1%. You want a drug that maybe has a benefit for a much larger fraction of the patients. But I think the recent successes in the field have really changed the thinking about that, that if you can get a drug to the right patient, and do it efficiently, you can get your drug approved quicker and you can get a much better patient outcome. And in fact, there's economic incentives that will line up with that. You can do it right. If you think about the Zakori approval and how it happened in four years from discovery of Target, that would not have happened had we not had patients prospectively screened to identify. There were 255 patients that went into the FDA approval. So their response rate among 255 patients was what basically led to approval and to have treated all comers, all non-small cell lung cancer patients, regardless of genotype, you can imagine how many thousands of patients you would have needed to have to find those 3 to 5%. Absolutely. And if you think about if we were to only use our old metrics of response rate in a broad population, you'd see a 4 or 5% response rate and would toss it and never look back. And you have to wonder how many of our small response rate drugs are really just an issue of not finding the right patients for them. Hopefully we're moving into a new era of no longer throwing out the baby with the bathwater by if we could just look more intelligently. It does bring up a lot of issues. And one is it's no longer possible to offer these trials throughout a big network. In every town, you can get this big trial of standard chemo with or without drug X. If you have a ROS1 mutation or an ALK rearrangement, it's certainly at various points, people had to get on a plane and go to where those trials are. Mm-hmm. I think that's a big change. First of all, a lot of times their own doc is not going to know about these new mutations. Second, the trials are going to be available at a handful of places or a small network that could be national, global, whatever. And it really requires them to do a lot more of the legwork for that. On the other hand, the upside is 
much greater than you would tend to see with just adding one drug to a broad population. I wonder about the feasibility of doing broad studies and essentially having like two shots on goal, looking at it the way that Tarsiva exists, which is in a broad population, you can say that there's a modest but meaningful benefit, and in a more targeted population, it's a different phenotype of response. In that way, you could test it in phase two setting broadly and then look at what you've got. If you buy a standard approach are looking for subgroups, and then you can have that inform your next steps of who best to study this. I wonder if that's the way to go. We've seen that with Tevantinib with ARQ197. They say, oh, well, this looks like it really works in a non-squamous population. We'll focus on that. Metmab, Dr. Spiegel, led that work, and I think that has huge implications. We haven't talked about it, but in that study, it was pretty much half the patients were high expressors of MET and half were not. If you look at the overall population, mixing those two populations, you see nothing. It doesn't look like much of anything. What actually goes in there, and David, you can speak to this, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a dramatic benefit, it appears, in the half who are high expressors, and equally concerning is the other half have a detrimental effect. And you wonder how many people we are treating deleteriously by just not knowing enough and just mixing everybody together. David, you have thoughts? Well, well, I think it highlights that there are different ways you can find markers. You can try to screen up front and then select patients who have that marker, get that therapy. Or you can do a little bit of a fishing expedition where you're treating all comers to some extent, but you're collecting tissue. I mean, I think that's probably where we've been guilty as clinical researchers is all those studies I've shown you, major trials, hundreds if not thousands of patients, and many of them we didn't collect anything. So all those opportunities to look for small groups were lost. But I think going forward, it's rare to see a new trial get created that doesn't have a big correlative component to it. I will say there are some big challenges. We're talking about advanced cancer right now. I was just at a meeting recently. I'm not sure you guys were there, but a discussion was made. Well, what about your patients who have EMO4 out translocations with stage 2 lung cancer? So some proposals were put forward about potential trials to look at that group. I mean, great questions, right? It was thought that it might take nine years to do a trial mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Can we really wait nine years? And some of the statisticians were thinking it might take four or five years after that to really have final results. Can we really afford to wait 10 years to get a drug like that to patients in early stage disease? Of course, we don't know if it benefits them or not, but those are real clinical trial dilemmas. I think we've seen a lot of interesting things. First of all, yes, just like the FDA had to redefine their criteria, we will probably have to redefine our criteria for what is acceptable for creating a new standard of care or guidelines. It's not always going to be randomized phase three big trials. It's just not feasible to do that in 1% populations anymore. So we will have to do a little more extrapolation. The concern, though, is sometimes we guess wrong. We've seen that with SWOG0023 of maintenance by RESA. It was not in a selected population, but we all presumed on a bad day it would just be neutral, and it was harmful. And Significantly so. The Canadian BR19 trial was also in an unselected population, also with IRESA in the adjuvant setting, and not statistically, but a strong trend toward a deleterious result there compared to placebo. And I think even more puzzling was the subset analysis by mutation stats, where even the EGFR mutation patients had a trend in the wrong direction, and it was even stronger than in the general one. Now, we can hand wave about why that happened, but the point is none of us would have suggested prospectively that that was in the realm of possibility, and that's why I think it's humbling for us to think about making too many presumptions that we know what the answer is going to be ahead of time. But it gets back to the question of biomarker development, which is a very difficult area. And that is, it's all very well to talk about testing biomarkers prospectively, but your preclinical models, your pre-human models, don't necessarily tell you what is going to happen in the human. And therefore, to do what David did in the MetMab study where they gave the treatment to everybody and then did the biomarker analysis, 
I think that's an easier way to do the development than to actually identify a robust marker up front, which is what happened in the elk saga, and that is that you had a very good biomarker, but that to a degree was fortuitous, and it's not always going to be that easy. When you design these big phase three trials, it's always difficult to know to what degree you lean on your potential biomarker or not. And then what's a more complicating issue, because I know you guys have stories like this. I was at a meeting recently where a patient got up and talked about two years of benefit on Tarceva, but his EGFR wild type. You know, that just complicates everything that we're, <laughs> we're talking about today. But can I ask one thing about those? We do see patients yeah. with all sorts of things. We see occasional patients who... The test says one thing, but they certainly behave like the other. Or the more we look, the more we find. We find people who have repeat biopsies that show a different histology now, things that we never would have thought possible. My sense is that we're only beginning to sense what we don't know, and a lot of the truisms of oncology are falling apart because we're looking, and we're seeing that tumors are very heterogeneous, and they do all sorts of odd things. And even the things like perhaps people can comment on In the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium, the general rule was these are mutually exclusive findings. Is that something that you feel confident is going to be the case, especially if we do serial biopsies, or are these going to be morphing over time? They're not entirely mutually exclusive. PS3 kinase mutations in particular seem to overlap with the other groups. Certainly, Repeat biopsies after the patient has been on drug are going to show different phenotypes. We already know that in terms of secondary mutations, in terms of other pathways being regulated. So yeah, it becomes a much more complicated soup once you start treating with drugs. I think we are going to realize how complex this really is and that even adenosquamous not that simple, actually, mm-hmm. and that you can't rest assured that once you found a mutation, you found the mutation, and that's the way it's going to be. Alice? I would say, if you think about how long we've been doing the genetic testing, it hasn't been that long, and so we're only on the brink of all these new discoveries. And in terms of overlap, in general, we don't see much overlap, but of course, there are examples in LCMC, and there are especially examples in Asia, where we saw their EGFR mutations are so much more common. So there are examples of overlapping EML4-ALK and EGFR and a few patients here and there. But I think as we get more and more patients genetically tested, we're going to have more information on that sort of thing. You would think biologically, though, that doesn't make too much sense to have multiple oncogenic drivers, because in the lab, it's very clear that each one of these can really drive the growth of the tumor. So there shouldn't really be too much selective pressure to have multiple oncogenic drivers, but we do see it on occasion. I wonder if what we will actually see is as you suppress one, another subpopulation can rise and that you can have a yin-yang kind of phenomenon. And it's really under evolutionary pressure in real time of the cancer over the course of a line of treatment. I mean, your group has shown that uh, with small cell. Absolutely, uh, yeah. There's a lot of heterogeneity even in the beginning, but we know it in the context of resistance because that's where we do all our repeat biopsies primarily. We'll continue with the presentation by Dr. Glenn Goss, speaking on the implementation of molecular marker testing across a broader healthcare system. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our GraceCast, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info, and that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support. Thanks again.